El mundo de los proveedores de Internet está dominado por dos o tres jugadores que argumentan tener la conexión más eficiente al mejor precio. Pero ¿qué tan cierta es esta declaración cuando todo el beneficio real es para ellos mismos? El día de hoy nos acompaña Deborah Sampier, CEO y cofundadora de Althea Network y Gravity Bridge, para hablar sobre el potencial de los proveedores de Internet descentralizado y los beneficios que traen a sus usuarios. Hello, dear friends from the Cryptoverse. Thank you once again for another week and coming and join us in Cryptomonedas.deo. As you know, we're always looking to bring awesome content and talking to amazing people in the Cryptoverse. Today, we have the pleasure and honor of having in the program, Deborah Sempie. She's the CEO of Althea. Welcome, Deborah. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks so much for having me. My pleasure. So the reason we wanted to do this episode is because we believe that the access to internet is pretty much a, a global right at this stage in time. Everyone should have access to an internet connection. The thing is that most times there's a lot of barriers or if not barriers, it's, uh, you know, entry costs for internet services are really high and there's huge monopolies. You know, most of us are from Latin America. And in most Latin American countries, it's one or two companies that provide all the bandwidth and they, you know, have hold all the doors and they hold all the keys. And we've been following Althea for a while. So I would just love for you to tell us a little bit about yourselves. Well, about yourself, Deborah, right. And yeah, just a little bit about Althea. Yeah, so um, I think you really got to the heart of the issue. Althea was really born from that problem space of both um, understanding as a, I'm, I'm from a rural place here in the US where um, okay. internet access was, was problematic um, because infrastructure is very you know capital inefficient. Like the way that we build teleco infrastructure doesn't make sense. Um, and this is a lot of, this is the reason why it's very expensive or, um, you know, we'll see, uh, Things like the the plans will be, you know, like Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp is free, and then the rest of the internet costs money. Um, we see these kind of, you know, um, user capture models that aren't really good for the carriers, and then they're not really good for users. Um, totally. And then I think, you know, the other space that we didn't quite touch on yet is um, these sort of key freedoms of the openness of the internet was really a big part of Althea. How do we protect those? And we protect those by having decentralized ownership. Because when we own something, what does that mean? It means that we can leverage that infrastructure to earn revenue. Um, many different people can, not just big monopolies. Um, and then we can have choice over it. So those are the kind of core principles of Althea is true ownership and democratization of the infrastructure of the internet and then access to the internet itself. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I, I think a lot of people don't understand, you know, how costly the internet can be it, even. If, and coming back to the centralized aspect of the internet, you know, like even like web, um, like cloud services and things like that. A lot of people don't know that most websites are still relying on AWS and other services that are highly uh, centralized. So just listening to projects like yours is just amazing to see people that had those issues when they were like growing up where they recognized that there was a need in the markets for that. And I think blockchain really brings an opportunity to give access to people to these services at a way lower cost. Yeah. And I think that's a really great point. You bring up the fact that most of this is centralized and, you know, really kind of under the hood with the internet, it's very brittle too. So you totally. know, we see that sometimes in terms of like a natural disaster will happen or there'll be some routing issues and like half of the <laughs> country will go out. Yeah. Or countries will censor that information, right? A country can just decide to throw down the, you know, the curtain and no internet can get in and out. Um, and that's what centralization leads us to. It's extremely brittle, but if we decentralize the infrastructure, then, you know, we can create more resilience and uh, open models. Absolutely. And so you said you came from a rural background, right? 
And when you were growing up, like which were the services that you were mainly using for internet providers? Yeah. So I'm um, just one, of course, that's, that's very uh, common. Right. Yeah. And, um, you know, copper, mostly like a, a DSL line, which is like a copper line to your home, the same that you would use for your phone. Um, and I think what's really interesting, and I think maybe some uh, of the listeners will relate is that this community here, um, that had around a thousand people living in it received a million dollars worth of a uh, million dollars us to build internet infrastructure. And so the company came along and what did they build? It was their company. They're going to build where that was most capital efficient for them. And um, so, <laughs> so that means it didn't met, meet very many people's needs, right? Just sort of rebuilt over the top of where the infrastructure already was. And, um, you know, that model was really brittle. And then, you know, a couple years down the road, the company sold out to a bigger one. And so then we had yeah. a bigger monopoly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, and it's not that these companies are evil, it's that the yeah, models exactly. are broken. And it's that's what's really so exciting about blockchain. We can align, you know, the user experience. So what's good for the user is good for the, the telecom as well. But that's not the case currently. So that's what we really have to do. And that's what I'm so excited about doing this with, with, with blockchain. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that was exactly my, my next question. Like, why deciding using, you know, blockchain for building a decentralized internet provider? Like, what was the thing that you finally saw that you said, like, this is the way we're going to make this happen? Yeah, I mean, definitely my former point about being able to align, um, you know, users that empower them to actually be part of the infrastructure themselves. I think the composability is really the other exciting aspect. You know, uh, part of how Althea works is microtransactions, um, send the the different revenue share and automatically yeah. trans and the other piece is transparency um totally. so part of what Althea is building is something we call liquid infrastructure and that means you can okay. take the actual fiber optic cable the tower and represent that as an nft or as a tokenized asset and the reason yeah. why you can do that is that you can see the revenue and all those little microtransactions going to that one token um and you know i think most of the world doesn't really understand what internet infrastructure is actually built because we just, you know, we send folks out with shovels and they put some fiber yeah. in and nobody knows. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's really exactly. Hard. It's hard to invest in that. So if you have capital and you want to invest in that market, how do you do that right now? If you wanted to own a piece of a, a, a tower, a radio tower, how would you do that? Okay. Like, <laughs> but now, totally. we can. now we can, and we can put those private dollars to work in fact into our communities and that money can stay, you know, local and enrich that community itself. Yeah, exactly. I think like ever since I started in this space, it's been amazing to see all these different protocols and projects that are looking at ways of integrated blockchain technology into like solutions of everyday life from decentralized VPN services or decentralized cloud computing services. And really once people get like read a little bit and do a little bit of research, they'll understand how much power they can take back and how much, you know, like sometimes people don't like to take that responsibility, but I believe that here in the blockchain space and everyone that has been around down the rabbit hole and has his life absolutely consumed by blockchain and cryptocurrencies can relate to the fact that we want more sovereignty, right? And we want more freedom and we want more options. So it's, it's amazing. And like we were talking a little bit about this before we started the recording, we are, we follow you on all social pages and we see that you're really active. And I would like to ask, like, I know that you're flying all over the place and doing a bunch of stuff, but what were the biggest challenges you faced when you started this enterprise? That's a great question. There, there's a lot. I think that, um, you know, being an underrepresented founder, and I think, you know, maybe some folks in that I'm going to understand too, it's very difficult to, to break into, you know, a world that's mostly venture capital funded and, you know, founders sort of look like a typical <laughs> set they're from yeah. the sf you know they yeah. they're you know um younger white white guys like so yeah. um i think that was one of the challenges was to you know really share that this innovation can come from anywhere yeah um but i you know uh telco telecom is also highly monopolized so and it's it's heavily capital intensive and so we spent um, a long time really building out the fundamentals, including what we call the Gravity Bridge, which is an independent blockchain on the cosmos yes. that um, links 
the EVM or Ethereum ecosystem to the Cosmos ecosystem. And that was a key pillar of interoperability so that you could use all those easy to access stable coins, um, you know, from fiat um, onto this interoperable space on Cosmos where fees were lower. But that took, you know, roughly two years. It's like 70,000 lines of codes. It was a, a, like an epic wow. project. Yeah, it's actually now the most widely adopted bridge in Cosmos. Um, you know, it's been forked, you know, half a dozen times and used in different modules. Yeah. So it was really in this hugely empowering technology. But anything in telco really required a lot of capital intensive, um, you know, foundational elements. So I would think the other kind of challenge there too. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great point you highlight about this. The idea of Cosmos at the end of the day, it's interoperability. Yeah. I remember when Absolutely. Osmosis first came out and they did the airdrop and like people were just focusing on the fact like, oh my God, I got a bunch of money right to my address. But I think the most amazing thing was that we finally got to see IBC fully operational. And a lot of things like in the past couple of months, you know, with the whole Luna crash and everything and how everything had to move light speed in the Cosmos ecosystem to add additional collateral and have access to all these resources when Axelar, you know, bridged over a uh, wrapped BTC, wrapped Ether, uh, USDC, all those things. I, I really don't think that people understand how big of a step it was because really that's the main idea behind Cosmos is bridging all these different ecosystems together, right? Absolutely. And I think the next, I think where we'll start to, you know, have better kind of share and understanding of that is now when inter what they call interchain accounts is coming out. And that's really yeah. exciting. Too. Yeah. And that's with Althea, basically from this router in your phone um, or this wallet in your phone or, you know, your router or just your normal telecom experience, you'll be able to access like all of the Ethereum ecosystem and then all of the Cosmos ecosystem from one, you know, transaction, from one signing, one wallet. And that's that, you know, iPhone moment of interoperability and UX that I think we're looking for. So I think Absolutely. pretty soon, as soon as interchain accounts gets, um, you know, integrated into more Cosmos chains, that, that light bulb moment is really going to come on. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's going to be huge. And you were mentioning Gravity Bridge a couple of minutes ago. Can you tell everyone hear what gravity really is all about? So gravity really is all about that interoperability. It's, um, but it's interoperability with decentralized infrastructure. So we've seen a lot of bridges in the past from Ethereum to Cosmos and other ecosystems, but what have they been? Multi-sigs, right? They're just essentially exactly. a couple of people get together and they sign a transaction. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's not very innovative, right? Um, and that's not why we're here, you know? So what, what's so exciting is um, oh, Gravity cool. Bridge is actually a fully decentralized blockchain bridge run by the validators on Cosmos. So Deborah, I would like to know about uh, Gravity because you were talking a couple of seconds ago about what Gravity Bridge is about. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, multi-chain bridges, um, this one between Ethereum and Cosmos are not necessarily new, but normally what we thought of in the past is bridges are, are mostly just like fancy multi-sigs, right? It, it's a few people that exactly. come together, sign a transaction. That's not very blockchain-like. That's a corporation um, or just a group of individuals. Totally. So what's revolutionary about Gravity is it's truly decentralized. It's run by the validators on a Cosmos blockchain. Actually, other than the Cosmos hub, um, the Gravity Bridge has the most active um, um, validators at 163 active validators that are wow. in the community. And it um, has a large community pool of token holders that, you know, vote on um, how, you know, things move forward and incentives and all of that. So it's a true decentralized blockchain bridge. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, like, I believe... It's impacting things, you know, like Stargaze with uh, blockchain interoperability for their, for their, um, oh my God, what's the standard for? ICS 721 I, for NFTs. Exactly. ICS, <laughs> yeah. ICS 721 and Stargaze. Yeah. And then you also have like Crescent and this, what, what you're talking about, you know, the, the interchange standard, it's really like, like I said, the, the, the changes from when I started in this space to now, it's just like impressive and yeah it's just like you said gravity bridge is just growing tremendously and the transactional value in it and yeah i totally agree with the multi-sig you know like for most people that don't know what a multi-sig is is like pretty much what deborah is saying is just like a fancy uh cryptoverse 
corporation pretty much because at the end of the day, it's highly centralized and it's only a couple of people that are really making the decisions. So it's amazing to see that you're, you know, using and developing this tool that actually brings full decentralization for this space. That's going to bring this interconnection between other ecosystems. So that's amazing. Yeah. And interconnection is the name of the game. Like, I think it's so exciting to think about NFTs moving between Ethereum and Cosmos. Totally. Or we were talking totally. about like using a token representation for, you know, fiber optic cables. Um, what if you could pay yeah. for that with stable coins? That's how all of this decentralized infrastructure on the, on the Althea side interacts with the gravity bridge interacts with NFTs. It's, it's exciting. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Deborah, why do you think that it's, important to decentralize the provider industry like firstly for people and secondly for the mass adoption of blockchain well i think you know it kind of comes back to what i was saying earlier and when you decentralize and you have ownership in a democratic way you have choice and that's really the only way that we can maintain our choices and our freedoms um, about something so um, integral as the internet um, and also our financial freedom. And I think that telecom is, you know, this is how we interact with the world all the time. It's on our phones. Um, yeah. So <laughs> um, if, if that's the easiest way for us also to have financial empowerment tools that are right there at our fingertips. And I think that's really key to having that mass adoption. And it's really, it is that, that iPhone moment that really easy, you know, easy to use interface. Yeah, absolutely. That's I think the biggest the biggest thing that most projects, you know, have to get over just making it easy for people to use it. Because back a couple of years ago, just using a couple of wallets and even going back, you know, more years, it was really complicated for people to understand how to sign the transaction and how to interact with this. But really in the last two years, the interfaces have improved dramatically and it's just I think the best moment in time to get like easy onboarding, you know, to all these different protocols like Althea is. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And obviously we see that you're really active in social media. And I think that that's a great way of communicating what really decentralized internet providers are going to bring, you know, to the table. So how do you manage to reach people and help them understand the benefits of using a decentralized internet provider? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, it, it, we, it looks a little bit different for us. We do a lot of very local work. So where we have yeah. that coverage or where there's a network or someone else, a partner building a network. So we, we work directly with people in their community who are looking to deploy this kind of a network or a smaller provider that wants to bring this uh, to their community. Um, and then there's a lot of, you know, kind of very high touch uh, kind of marketing. So not only do we use the sort of global Twitter, um, there we also meet people where they're at in their communities themselves. A lot of the way we think about fiat onboarding is using your local corner store where you're going to be going anyway to get your milk or whatever. That's where you could get your crypto. <laughs> that's where you can get yeah, your right? centralized internet. Yeah. So it should be just a part of our daily lives. And that's really that integration model. Yeah, absolutely. I think, like you said, once we start, you know, like getting over those barriers and those hurdles and we just make it super easy for people that just walking up to their local convenience store and just paying for the internet, that's going to be just, I mean, you already have it deployed, which is like yeah. amazing. I remember the first time I looked at the Althea network website, I was like, wow, this is amazing. You know, like just to, because it's all these things, you know, that have been said in the past. And a lot of people think of, I was listening to a podcast earlier today that a lot of projects in the space are still a lot of promises, you know, like a, a lot of things like, oh, we, we will do this and we will, but just, I think Cosmos has really, you know, like been super consistent with the roadmaps and just all the projects that have come to the Cosmos ecosystem, it's the same level of commitment. So just to hear like your approach to the whole decentralized uh, provider industry and how you're already like deployed and to see all the efforts that you're putting into the community is just amazing. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, one of the things I'm proud about is that we developed our product very closely with our users. Um, so that feedback loop was really tight instead of just sort of, you know, building something that we thought would work and then, you know, perfecting yeah. it and bring it out. We worked together to make sure that it was the right product and, you know, that we had that traction and now it's really just growth and scaling. That's amazing. Yeah, I think that's a central point of everything because the traditional model is just I put a product out there and let's see how we adapt. But you building it if, like with the user 
like in mind and in conjunction with the end user, I think that's brilliant for adoption. So I really congratulate you and the whole team in LTF for thinking about how to properly integrate this new technology into society. That's great. Appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure. And then Deborah, where do you see LTS Chief's use case? Like where, where do you think that it's going to mainly be used? Because obviously you have like the average Joe, which needs internet for, I don't know, for their cell phone or their store or whatever, but what are the chief, you know, uses that we're going to see in the couple, in the next couple of years? Yeah, so we, we call Althea kind of the idea of broadband Legos. It's almost like that Legos okay. platform, right? So it's, it can yeah. be a lot of flexible <laughs> ways to deploy networks and to build them. And so I think we'll see almost like a Linux-like adoption. So you'll see it in a lot okay. of things under the hood, a lot of networks, yeah. a lot of, you know, your, you know, maybe even something like Telmax will run Althea under the hood. Yeah. Um, because yeah. it, it works. It gives the provider opportunities to build networks in flexible ways. It gives the user a lot more choice. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't know that you necessarily have like a Microsoft moment, but it'll just sort of like be in the, in the Althea inside everywhere. Absolutely. I think that's how pretty much blockchain technology will continue to be adopted. Like people won't even understand that things are running on blockchain and they'll, they'll still think, you know, like, no, it's this evil technology and we have to step, you know, like we don't, we, we can't use it, but they'll really not understand that most of these companies will already have made agreements with, because at the end of the day, blockchain is highly scalable and it really brings solutions for problems that they've been trying to figure out for, I don't know, 10, 20 years, because we've pretty much been stuck. Like, I, I believe that there hasn't been a lot of innovation, like it's, been sugarcoated as innovation, but there, there haven't really been dramatic changes for many industries, like really big breakthroughs. And we really think that blockchain technology is what's really going to push many industries like to the next level. Absolutely. Well, it comes down to that interoperability. So if you totally. can bring that, the infrastructure, the supply line, the financial, the microtransaction, agriculture, like all these different pieces can all interoperate on a blockchain. And so I really think not only is the future blockchain, the future is multi-chain as well. Totally. Totally. And I mean, for example, right now in the Cosmos ecosystem, I think the chains that implement IBC are around like 45 to 47 different networks. But once, you know, the bridge has been built for Ethereum, that opens the gates for just, oh my God, like I was watching a video by this. I, I don't know if you've ever seen a video of Cryptocito that he's always talking about different Cosmos projects, et cetera, et cetera. And he was saying, you know, like, Maybe next year, I think it's going to be like 250, but I think, really think that once people understand the power of Gravity Bridge and all those things, everyone is just going to keep coming to Cosmos and understanding what really the value of interoperability is for the space. Totally 100% agree. agree. Yeah. Well, Deborah, we've talked about amazing stuff and really interesting, but there's some questions that really deserve to be addressed. And these are going to be like some rapid fire questions. So just answer the first thing that comes to mind. Okay. So Deborah, which were the first cryptos you bought? I mined Bitcoin back in really? 2012, 2013. Yeah. Back. No way. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So I don't know. I, yeah, I, I tend to not buy, I tend to mine or, or build. So um, yeah, that was, that's Bitcoin. awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, we, we always tell people that there's more than one way to interact with yeah. the space. And definitely, you know, like blockchain, once again, brings many options for people that if they instead of want to buy, be more of like a technical, you know, person that wants to deal with ASICs and all those things, it totally can. So it's amazing to see like, so you're a big, you're an OG. You're part of the old <laughs> Maybe just old, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, that's awesome. And Deborah, what's your favorite beer? My oh, probably root beer, actually. Um, so I love okay. <laughs> I love to work and, and I need to be sharp for that. So most of my most of my beer is of the root type, root beer. Okay, got it. Yeah, no no coronas for you then. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's where I work, which is all the time. Yeah, I I believe you. And Deborah, what are your favorite hobbies besides crypto, you know? 
Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, we talked a little bit about that being from a rural area, actually I'm a farmer. Yeah. So uh, enjoy livestock and um, we have cows and, and uh, horses and um, pigs and chickens and all of those kinds of things. So enjoy that. That's awesome. It, it's funny because like I've heard a bunch of people in the crypto space that they're super passionate about like the countryside and you know, like I love, you know, my, like my plants and having my own tomatoes, but I've we've really seen that a lot of people in the crypto space specifically are all about, you know, growing their own food and you gotta have that completely independent. <laughs> exactly. You know, if we're going to be full on anarchist, we, you know, have to grow our own foods and stop going to, to Whole Foods and stop going to Walmart and just having all that good stuff in our houses. Yep. And Deborah, what are your favorite books? Oh, I've always been a big fan of Les Miserables. Um, okay. It's very much uh, the human experience and, you know, sort of that underdog, the battle of like mercy against this, you know, unflinching state. So I, yeah. uh, I feel like it's very much a, you know, a crypto uh, anarchist tale as well. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And Deborah, if you could choose a superpower between invisibility or flying, which one would you choose and why? Well, I was a, I, I was a pilot a very in my early, wow. you know, like, yeah. Oh my in, God, you've uh, done everything. <laughs> yeah. In, in um, a long time ago. So I would probably choose flying. I very much love that. Plus being able to be around a variety of different people all the time, whenever I wanted to would be very cool. Absolutely. That's awesome. And there were, I want, so this question is like focus on one asset, but I'm going to, you know, make it a little bit more fun. I'm focusing too. So what are your calculations price wise for both Bitcoin and Cosmos for the next two years? Like 20, Boy, that's 20, a tough 20. one. I, I, tough I, I would, I would say that I am a very long believer. I have not ever sold any of that Bitcoin that I have mined. Wow. Um, because I believe that it is the future, um, wow. along with Cosmos. So, um, while I hate to speculate about price, I do believe that it is our long-term future. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Deborah, I want to thank you so much for taking some of your time today and coming and sharing your experience with us and talking about Althea. Like we said, we really, we follow you on, on everything and follow everything that you do. And we're really thankful for all the work that you're doing because we truly think that we need to decentralize every single thing that we can decentralize and I, we do think that the future of Althea is great. The future of gravity is amazing. And thank you and your team for constantly, you know, being hands-on and working nonstop for making decentralized internet providers a reality. I appreciate it. So great to talk with you today. Absolutely. And before we go, can you tell people when they can find out more about Althea and how they can follow you and get more updates? Yeah, so we're on Twitter, um, but I definitely recommend joining our Discord and getting involved with the community there. You can also go to Althea.net if you're interested in um, starting an Althea network or participating in an Althea network. There's a great form to fill out, and some of our team will help guide you through the process. That's awesome. And then you also do a lot of uh, Twitter spaces, right? We do. Every Friday um, at noon Pacific time is our community call and invite folks to participate in that too. It's, um, it's a great way to get involved in the community. Awesome. So you heard Deborah, go and follow them and find out what's the next step for Othea. And once again, Deborah, thank you so much for sharing some time with us and we'll see you again soon. All right. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.